looking at it. Well, I'm going to be uh, talking tonight um, about pots of covenant. And I'm going to be using a theme. How many of you saw the War Horse movie? That's the theme I'm going to be speaking from. And um, Father, I thank you for your presence that is in this house. Lord, we just speak blessings over Darlene, that you continue to just pour out the um, eternal songs from your throne into her heart. Father, continue to use her to awaken and to open up portals of worship where the angels ascend and descend and bring the sounds of heaven um, to earth. We just thank you for her servanthood, for her coming from Vermont, and Lord, we just embrace her with arms of love embrace her as family and just again speak amazing favor and blessings upon her life. In the glory of your name we pray this morning. Amen. Amen. So I'm going to speak about covenant uh, as I said um, unfolding this movie. If you haven't seen it hopefully um, this will make sense. I think it will. Um, in the movie The War Horse um, there was this magnificent horse that this man purchased for 30 guineas. He needed a plow horse, that's what he went to purchase. But he was so stunned and taken by this magnificent horse, he could not um, um, pass him up. Interestingly enough, his son had watched this horse literally be born, and had watched this horse, this colt, grow to this magnificent horse. And he had always had in his heart, you know, that one day would it ever be possible that this horse could be his. And so when the father brought him home, the son was the one that was responsible to train him. And he trained him with a particular whistle that called him. It was a, a sound that this horse responded to. Um, it was a whistle of one who loved him. It was a whistle of one who cared for this horse, who had a heart um, uh, that just so loved him. And it was a place of safety. And they formed, this young man and this horse formed this deep, deep relationship and that relationship was formed um, out of a purposeful and intentional time together. It didn't just happen. It wasn't just a horse in a stall that he fed once a day, gave some water, and that was it. No. This was a purposeful relationship that was formed. And um, this was a magnificent, absolutely magnificent horse. Um, and this is, part of where I'm going tonight is, how God also views us. Um, it's really important that, I, I teach this a lot, but it's really so important. One scripture that I want to share tonight is Song of Songs 1, 8 through 9. Because as this boy saw how magnificent this horse is, the Lord sees us in such an amazing way. Listen to what he says about us. Listen, my beloved one, my beautiful one. If you ever lose sight of me, just follow my footsteps where I have led my beloved ones. Come with all your burdens and cares. Come to the place near the sanctuary of the shepherds. There you will find me. My dearest one, let me tell you how I see you. You are so thrilling to me. To gaze at you is like gazing at one of Pharaoh's finest horses. The strong royal steeds which pull his royal chest. Isn't that phenomenal? How he sees us, the ones that are his, is so magnificent, just so magnificent. And our value and our worth, we know that our value and our worth was the price he paid for us, which is his life. The price paid for Jesus, his betrayal was 30 shekels. The price paid for this horse was 30 guineas. And what we need to do is constantly, because the enemy will come at us and attack our covenant relationship with God and our covenant relationships at earth. He will do everything he can because it's the cross. Always he's assaulting that. And so we have to constantly align our lives with his shed blood and his declarations over us. So this boy had gazed at this horse for quite a while. And when he was training this horse, he would place his face in his eyes, eye to eye with the horse. Eye to eye, face to face. And how, what he did was he earned the horse's trust. Trust is earned, and trust is earned in our relationships on earth. It's not automatic. Not deep trust, anyways. Not the type of 
trust I'm talking about here that this story will build upon and will prove what covenant, what length one will go to when you are in true covenant. I dare challenge you that most do not know what true covenant is. And the first time that he would attempt to harness this horse, the, the horse flipped out, the, the horse was petrified, but he continued to put himself eye to eye and face to face with this horse, and the horse trusted him. He trusted the gaze of his eye. That's what he trusted, what he saw in the eye of this boy. And when we look into the eye of Jesus in the midst of troubling circumstances, when we can get face to face with him in the midst of the nightmares of our soul, he's the one that we can trust. And when we have relationship with people who are truly our covenant friends, truly our covenant family, we see in their eyes the trust of the Lord. That's something that I look for when I look in people's eyes. Do I see the Lord's eyes looking back at me? I look deeply into people's eyes because what I'm looking for is the King. Who's looking back at me? It's very important to me. People's eyes, the gaze, what's in their eye. And so it's eyes of covenant love and devotion that this horse saw in this boy. He saw in this boy safety. And so, that face-to-face -face speaks of that covenant love and devotion. Um, and what that does is it forms a deep, hot response. The horse's heart began to bond with this boy, as this boy's heart bonded with this horse. It says in Psalm 89, 1-4, this, This forever song I sing is the gentle love of God overwhelming me. Young and old delight will hear about your faithful, steadfast, never-failing love. Here's my chorus. Your palace of praise is built to last forever. Your faithfulness is firm, standing up to the skies. And I heard the Lord say, my covenant has been made, and I am committed forever to my chosen one, David. I have made my oath that there will be sons of David forever, sons that are kings through every generation. What an amazing promise. Sons that are kings through every, every generation. That's you and me. That's covenant relationship that we come into with the Father. And we come into the rights as sons. And we come into this place where we're his sons and yet we rule and we reign as kings over the earth. It's an amazing blessing. And so this is what true sonship is. This is what true covenant is. The opposite of this is we've often looked at in the past is the orphan heart and the orphan spirit. And I'm not going to take a lot of time on that tonight, but let us just quickly review. It's, it's a fatherlessness. It's a person that doesn't live in inheritance. Fearful, dismayed, confused, filled with shame, self-willed, rebellious, self-centered, arrogant, proud, and envious, often depressed, disconnected, and independent. That's the spirit of an orphan. That's an orphan heart and an orphan spirit. But a son, the sonship is their father, they're fearless, they're safe. Um, they live in fullness of inheritance. They're secure. They're servants. They're aligned with heaven. Their cry is, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. They're humble. They're giving. They live in abundance. They walk in peace. They walk in joy. They live in the presence of God in total dependency. Can you see the complete opposite? One cancels the other out. And we're all in the place of being brought from any place of orphan, heart, spirit, mind, and thinking into the place of sonship. And it's a journey. But we need to rep recognize the places um, of what, you know, orphan or sonship. He talks in Song of Songs 1-5, My dearest darling, you are so lovely that you are beauty itself. To me, your passionate eyes are like loyal doves. Now, you see, we have to believe this. It's not enough to quote it. It's not enough for me to just read it. You have to believe it. Do you believe that when God looks in your eyes, he, see eyes, he sees eyes of loyal doves? That's pretty phenomenal. It's the time to really know who we are. And then the dove, us, says back, Song of 
Psalms 1-5, I must have you, God, with no veil between us. Now that's a, the veil that, he's, that she's talking about there is the veil of religion, the veil of shame, the veil of fear. And these are passionate eyes. These are loyal dove eyes. This is the eyes of one who is face to face with God with a single gaze with no distractions. And there is a passion of fire in those eyes. They burn with a passion for the Lord. And so, this is one who is focused to steady his purposeful gazes in hearts. So, back to this horse. This is what this boy had with this horse. This is what this horse saw. Do you follow what I'm saying? This is what this horse saw. This purposeful, intentional relationship. Boy and horse. So now this farm needed to be plowed because the way that they paid for the farm was with the crops that they grew. And so, they had one horse. And this horse was not a plow horse, but it was all they had. Many came to watch that day. Many naysayers, naysayers came to watch. They um, spoke that it's not in this horse. He'll never be able to do it. He's not a plow horse. They cursed the father. They cursed the mother. They cursed the horse. They cursed the son. They put curses. They, but. The most amazing thing was out of relationship, this horse, out of devotion to this boy, this horse rose to the occasion. Out of devotion, he accomplished the impossible. Focused, determined, the horse and the boy together out of their passionate relationship, that which he was not bred to do, he did. And what does that mean for us, the naysayers that are in our life that say, she can't, he never will, that's impossible, they'll never rise to the occasion, they weren't taught that, they weren't trained in that, they don't have that gifting. But God is bringing forth from this place of covenant relationship with him, from this place of gazing into his eyes, he is bringing forth a generation and a race of people that's never been seen before, that walk in this place of covenant with God, that do the impossible, that the world says, and even those in the church say is impossible. It's the hour to rise up in the face of the naysayers and say, but I know a God, but I have a relationship with the king. And he's looked me in the eye and he says, will you do this for me? You see? It's all where we gaze. They said the same thing of him. He's just Jesus, Joseph's son, Carpenter's son. Who does he think he is? Well, he knew exactly who he was. The son of God who stepped out of heaven and came to, um, you know, save us. And so we we're a people of light. You know, I teach on that all the time. And Jesus' DNA is in us. We truly are new, be or new beings. His DNA is in us. We, that's a whole other teaching one day I'm really going to get into. Because this is where we need to live from, but I have to make sure I don't get off on that because that's a whole <laughs> teaching in itself. But just let me read a couple of passages from Psalm 18. God, all at once you turned on a floodlight for me, for you are the revelation light in my darkness, and in your brightness I can see ahead. What a God you are, your path for me has been per made perfect. All your promises are proven and true. You are the wraparound God that gives grace to me. And he goes on and on and on. Psalm 18 is one of my absolute favorite, favorite, favorite passages, but it says this. For here is how you empower me. Here. Here is how he empowers us. You want to be empowered? Why don't I have the power of God? Here is the answer. Your wraparound presence gives me victory. Amen. What is that? That's the wraparound presence of the intimate, up close, passionate arms of God, face to face, eye to eye, breath to breath, mouth to mouth, that devotion that the power of God comes from. And from that place, we are enabled to do the impossible, the absolute impossible. Where is it from? This place of covenant relationship. So the horse was sold by the father, and the boy wasn't there. He was sold, sold into the army, but the boy found him before he was taken.
taken off and he looked in the horse's eyes. He put his eyes to his eye, his eyes, and he made a covenant promise. And this is what he said, I swear I will find you and I will bring you home. I swear I will find you and I will bring you home. That went into that spirit's, that horse's heart and spirit. Animals understand. They have a great understanding. And when we look into somebody's eyes and we say something from covenant, heaven is looking. Heaven is listening. This is in our people that we did not make covenant with God or with man and take it lightly. I'm telling you, I'm telling you, as Vic Joyner said, what we got away with in days behind will get us killed in this day. And I do mean killed. People are being taken out. God is not fooling around. It's a very serious hour, and yet it's an amazing hour of God. Covenant promise. And then what he did, he took his father's war ribbons and he tied it to um, the bit and bridle on him. And so the horse goes off to battle and off to war with these covenant ribbons and with this covenant promise. And this is what we live under. We are to live our lives under God's covenant promises. And what is that major promise? I will never leave you or forsake you. You are mine. We are divinely owned and possessed. It's divine ownership. And here's a passage I love about that from Song of Songs 2.4. It says, suddenly he transported me to his house of wine. You know what the house of wine is? It's the house of joy. It's the joy that we are his. It's the joy that we are his. And my eyes open to see this, his unfurled banner of victory. It's his unfurled Relenting love. Written upon a flag flying over my heart. I'm overwhelmed and I'm undone. So what are we to do? We're to live in this reality that is this flag, this magnificent flag is flying over our hearts. And this flag is this flag of unrelenting love. And we're supposed to be in response to that. Overwhelmed and undone. What is the flag flying over our hearts? Is it a flag of shame? Is it a flag of rejection? Is it a flag that says it's too late, you're too old, you've made too many mistakes? It's, what is the flag that's, that we're walking under that's flying over our lives? It's been long, too long, it's too hot, it's too whatever. We've got to, there's one flag that we ought to live under, his unrelenting love. And I'll tell you, not just for ourselves, but everybody who then comes in the peripheral, the you know, of our lives come under that flag and they will feel what we walk in. If we are walking in that place of the house of wine, which is the place of joy because of his unrelenting love, they come into that atmosphere. They may not know what it is, but they'll feel, feel it. So the horse, whose name is Joey, is sold to a British army captain who owned him. And they became very close. He was very tender-hearted, and he became close with this other black stallion named Chapcourt. And so in 1914, they're in this war in France, and this owner is killed. And these two horses, Joey and Chapcourt, are captured by the German army. And they try to stay together because they have this, crazy, this great relationship. Um, they were going to be killed, but this one soldier saw them and saw their value and suggested perhaps they could be used to, to pull the wagon of the wounded. Now here is where the experience of the farm work came in. Remember when he resisted the harness at first because of that covenant exchange they had, the eye and the trust, he became that farm horse that he was not meant to be. Because of that, he was able to take the harness and the other horse, Chakor, who doesn't understand it, it was flipping out. That horse went up to him, looked in his eyes, and the trust they had, that horse settled down, and his life was spared, and together they pulled the wagon of the wounded. You see, what is the importance of that is because the circumstances of our lives that we haven't understood, 
the jobs we have lost, the sicknesses, the positions that we feel are too hard, or, or maybe you felt they're below you, or the children that are gone astray, or the family that's fallen, whatever it may be, the things that we felt we were created to do, but they still haven't happened yet, dreams that are still there, but we haven't seen the fullness. We need to understand that each one of these things shapes us if we let it. It shapes us for the good or for the bad. It's our choice. But it's shaping us into the likeness and the shaping of our destiny. And then what it does is it trains us to help others just like that horse. That horse saved that other's horse's life in that circumstance. And we can help save somebody else's life. Physical life, spiritual life, help them from making mistakes from what we've gone through. As Rick Joyner has always taught me, do not waste your troubles. Do not waste your troubles. It's all how you view them. Um, because um, it's where we learn covenant. It's where we're trained into his likeness. So the second owner is a captain who's also nice and kind, but he's also killed. The third owner was um, in the German army. They were two young lads that were put in charge of them, but they went AWOL and took off with the horses. They were found and killed. Um, and so now there's the caretaker of the farm he had a granddaughter, and she finds the horses hidden, and she cares for them. But then the British Army comes along, and they take them from her, and now they're part of the British Army. And now what they're being used to do is to pull artillery. Now there's a man who's a caretaker of the horses, and he sees them, and he sees their magnificence. And his words were this, it's a pity, it's a pity, because he knew that their destiny, pulling these artillery guns, was at the most two months. It's the longest any horse would last pulling the artillery. And so he didn't want them to see their magnificence wasted on the battlefield. He was heart sick. And this is the truth with covenant fathers and mothers. Spiritual covenant fathers and mothers have the same posture over their sons and daughters. They help them and they don't want them to waste their lives and their cause. They want them to start strong and finish strong and not burn out. Everything is always about their best. Always about their best. That's true spiritual fathers and mothers. Um, again and again, these horses, they're put into the hands of caring people. It's absolutely amazing. Just like the Father's faithfulness to us again and again and again. He comes and rescues us again and again and again. He puts us in situations where his provision is there. As David wrote in Psalm 62, 1 through 2, I stand silently to listen for the one I love waiting. I love waiting as long as it takes for the Lord to rescue me. For God alone has become my Savior. He alone is my safe place. His wraparound presence always protects me. For he is my bodyguard and my champion defender, and there's no risk of failure with him. So, as we look at our lives again and again, I know as I look at my life, again and again, he's put me with ones that have cared for me, that have stood with me, encouraged me. Um, and it's really a time and a season that this reality um, is both with him in true covenant with the people in the body of Christ. And to do this and to be that, we need to be safe. Each one of us needs to be a safe place. We need to be a safe refuge. We need to be a place where people come and we speak the truth in love and we need to be committed and caring and loving. What people do with that is their choice, but that's who we need to be. So, here they are, um, now these horses, they're getting ready to now begin to pull artillery. Well, the black stallion, Chakpur, has a wounded leg. And 
man's trying to tell him, don't put this horse in. But they said, we don't care, we're putting him in, just put him in. Well, as they're getting ready to strap on the um, gear on him, the scene is Joey bursts forth and takes his place again, saving this horse's life. What was it? It was covenant devotion. These horses had formed a bond. They had the sensing. There was the knowing. That horse understood this other horse was wounded, and if he tried to pull that artillery, that artillery tank, he was going to die. And it's that type of thing. I remember being in the movies crying my eyes out at that scene. But at the same time, I was deeply moved by God, and I began to cry. I began to think of different ones that I knew that were struggling under the weight of religion, under man's programs, trying to earn approval, trying to find a place of recognition, living in shame, living in rebellion. My heart just began to be pulled and torn in that movie for the horse and for situations that I just saw people like they were chained to these things of artillery and trying to go up this hill and the circumstances of their life and the past, they're trying to drag it up. And it takes covenant spiritual mothers and fathers who will come in and help to say, you've got to understand this. It takes covenant devotion where we will literally take another person's place where we will count the cost because costly covenant relationships have no hesitation. They step right into situations. And it's from God's heart of love within them. There is no self-seeking. As Rick Joyner has taught me, we don't use people to build anything. A church is used to build people and to bring them into their destiny and bring them into true relationship with God. The minute that's reversed, we've entered into a spirit of religion. We're no longer acting in covenant or as spiritual fathers and mothers or as children because we're all family. He's a family God. Jonathan and David, Jesus, of course, is the ultimate example of this covenant devotion to the Father. He lived every, every bit of his life to please the Father. And we know the Father's response. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. That's what we need to listen for. Not what man says about us. At the end of the day, when we lay our head on the pillow, is the Father pleased? Have we brought him pleasure? That's what matters. Not what man thinks of us. What does heaven think? And covenant devotion, it's always been, who was at the foot of the cross? Who ran to the tomb? Who did not abandon Jesus in his trial and at the cross? Who do we have covenant with? If in your life you have covenant with nobody, but the spirit of sonship, the true kingdom, the true family is this. We're not here today and gone tomorrow covenant devotion. We'll stay when the times are tough, when we're pulling the artillery uphill. Have we not had that many times as a family? We feel like we're pulling the artillery uphill. When it's all dark and it's not looking so good, when we're in the thick of battle and the bombs are going off around us, if you jump out, you're not covenant. If you jump out, if you abandon ship, you are not in covenant. And I see a lot of that going on every day in the body of Christ. Out! Out! Jump! Change! Don't like this, I'm out! Don't like that, gone! Don't confront me! Nope! We forget God sees it all. The one who sits on his throne, as we so wonderfully say and worship tonight, the one who is seated on the throne, doesn't miss anything. Miss anything. He loves us. He'll never change. But there are consequences for our broken covenants without repentance. There's consequences. So now the boy is in the war. He's finally old enough to join the war. And what he's done is he's gone to keep his covenant promise. He's going to find this horse. If it costs him his life. He's going to find this horse. So the black stallion is, is hurt this leg, and he needs rest. So the caretaker brings him, the horse lays down, and never to get up again. But he 
didn't die alone. There was the caretaker. There was Joey, his best friend, his, his covenant friend. He stood with him to the end. His covenant partner, a war horse, one who knew how to run into the battle. One out of a thousand horses is a war horse. Do you know that that's we? It's what we were created to be, and we'll see that at the end. We're not to be sheep. That's when we're found. We're meant to be war horses. God's war horses. John at the cross, Mary and Mary, those who had intimate relationship, would not leave him alone. They did not abandon him when it got tough. The spirit of abandonment must end. And the spirit of sonship in covenant must take its place. It's imperative in this hour that we're in. The body must be safe. The father's in the house, and he's calling to us. He's whistling. Just like the boy would whistle to the horse, the father, the word of God has much to say about the shepherd or the hell, whistling to his people to come home. And his home is safe. And again, our hearts need to be safe. So now we're, uh, the British are um, running away, the Germans are coming, and there's this amazing scene of this tank, and there's this two horses, one is dead, and Joey who's alive, and this tank is coming right at him, and this horse is trapped, and he finally escapes, but he ends up running into the battlefield, he's running in the trenches, there's all this gunfire, and his running to all of this, and finally he gets caught in barbed wire and he can't escape. If you saw the movie, it's a horrendous mm -hmm. scene. Cried my eyes out. But you know, it's the same type of thing when, when we're in circumstances and it's like the enemy's in a tank. You ever been there and he's coming straight at us? And you don't see any way out. And then what happens is we can't see a place of escape and we can get caught entrenched in our mindset, mindsets of fear and unbelief, and we can get held captive and snared, not with barbed wire, physical barbed wire, but in our mind, fear and unbelief, and we are held just as fast, just as immovable as that horse was. And as that horse began to thrash and thrash, and to finally it realized, if it continued to thrash, it was just... It was just, it was getting worse. Where and how do we escape? Because what the enemy would have us do is live in this bow down, low, hell captive posture where we are barely alive spiritually. We're only able to cry out. We're not able to arise and run and be who we're created to be. Our thoughts and, and, and are all about the prisoners we are, how we see ourselves, we're captive in the barbed wire of shame, of our failures, of rejection, of comparison, of envy. We need to see those things that what they are. They are literally like a barbed wire cage that holds us. Every place of comparison, envy, rejection, shame, failure, all of those things is just like the scene of that horse. And the more you thrash around trying to free yourself, and then what happens is we're in that place and fear gets hold of us. Because, oh my God, we're caught. We can't get up. And you try to run to escape, but you only get deeper. You only get ensnared more. And there's only one fear to have, as I've taught many times, and that's the fear of the Lord. It's the only fear we're supposed to have. Because when we are in fear, fear from our soul, that's when we make wrong choices every single time. We are to be led with peace. That's what leads us is peace. Not throwing out fleeces. <laughs> People take that whole fleece thing and then try to make a whole teaching of we throw these fleeces before God. That's not the way it is when you're trying to make decisions. You have to know the voice of God and be led by peace. Um, but God is able to set us free from wrong choices and transform uh, and renew our minds um, because we can't wrestle change into our lives. You can wrestle with that barbed wire from now until the Lord returns. It really is that place of surrender. 
you surrender. You stop fighting. You stop fighting the Lord. You stop and you resist the enemy. Because we can't free ourselves with our own might and strength. It's surrendering our thoughts in his ways for him. And when we come into an encounter of the Father's covenant heart of love, we begin to be transformed. That's why the Father's heart and the understanding of the Father's heart is so important. Because in the Father's heart is the Father's gaze. And that gaze is that gaze of trust. No matter what circumstance that we are in, we have that covenant promise. So we're um, back to the scene in the movie. It's showing the scenes of the trenches of men, and they, they're looking out. The Germans are on one side, the British are on the other side, and they're seeing movement on the battlefield. And they're like, who can this be? What is out in the battlefield? And they both begin to whistle and make noises to whatever it is that's moving. And the British soldier, one of them raises a truce flag because he realizes it's a horse. He realizes this is an animal. This is a horse, a war horse that needs help. And he raises a truce flag and he begins to be shot at. They don't trust him. And he says, he says, I'm going to save the horse. His heart of compassion puts his whole life in danger. He cannot not go and respond. You see, the heart of the father is a heart of compassion. And when his heart is in our hearts, we cannot not respond. It drives us into the very place where our lives will be in jeopardy. That's what sends men and women to go and help prostitutes get off the street. It's what puts us in circumstances where we're in spiritual and physical danger because of this heart of compassion. And so what happens is, um, He's out there now, and he's attempting to free the horse, but he doesn't have an, 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 the right equipment. So the next thing you know, a German soldier comes out, and he brings cutters. And they do together what one could not do alone. Enemies come together out of compassion for one animal. It's quite a story. There was so much in this movie. There was so much. If the church won't prophesy, the media will, because this whole movie was about covenant. That's what it was. It was a message. Those who had eyes to see and ears to hear of what covenant is. It's an astounding movie. Because it is a heart of compassion that gives us the spiritual authority to heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out demons, preach the gospel. The horse had to trust again. The horse has been through many situations. And he had to be willing to surrender and remain silent and calm. But there was a sense of safety from these men. He sensed deep within that they would not hurt him. And you see, this is the importance of asking for discernment. Who around your life when they come to you? Is their intent to hurt you or to help you? And even those who help you, in the midst of it, you can be deceived. And the enemy will begin to tell you they're there to hurt you. Because any time we pursue healing with the Father, the enemy is right there to pull you out. Because the day we come into wholeness, holiness and looking like him, he's cooked. Mm -hmm. He's cooked. Mm -hmm. He will stop every place of healing that we pursue in our lives. He will throw everything that he can from the pit of hell at you. He does not want us whole. But they were here to help and they were not his next captors and he sensed this. If not, he would become more wounded. He would have just continued to struggle. All of his wounds would have got abscessed and he would have just died. Of starvation, dehydration, or by gunfire. And so when the Lord comes to set us free from the snares of death and captivity, he sees our places of captivity like this horse and we have to learn to trust. Oh, I don't know. I was hurt by that pastor before. I was hurt. You know, this one tried to help me, and I just said, and this one betrayed me, and this one left me, and this, and this, and this. Well, at some point, we have to trust again, or we are like that war horse in the battlefield, caught in the barbed wire with the enemy snares, going nowhere. And in fact, starving, dying, dehydrating, because there
There is no such thing as neutral in the kingdom of God. You are either advancing or you are losing ground. There is no such thing as treading water in the, in the kingdom of God. It's, it's, it's impossible. You are either growing more into his likeness or you are not. You're losing ground. And so he puts it to our lives. Those, um, he's saying, you have to learn to trust again. Who are you going to let cut off the barbed wire of your captivity? Who are you going to let touch those places and those wounds in your life? Who are you going to let help get you free? Who will you trust? And there are many who are captive because they don't trust anybody to help set them free. Or I can do it myself, which is the next lie. Because God has made his kingdom, a kingdom family, where there is the need, not of codependency, but we depend on each other through him. It's a precious gift. So, what happens is, um, they throw a, to a coin for who's going to get this, have this horse now that's just been free. And the Brits want it with the toy. Now, the, the horse is now in the trenches. And um, the boy is in the same trenches. This boy, they're actually together in the same battlefield, but the boy has been blinded temporarily with gas that came into the trenches. So he can't see. He just hears a horse go by. There's no reason to think it's his horse, anybody's horse. But the horse is really hurt, so they bring him to the hospital. And the doctors say, He's got tetanus, shoot him. And the soldiers are begging him, no, no, this is a magnificent horse. We don't have time for a horse. Look how many wounded people there are. Shoot him. How do we see each other? How do we see the past wounds in our own life? How do we see the wounds in somebody else's life? Because the places that we could be blind Places that spiritual tetanus can set in our lives. Do we say we're too busy? We have no time. It's too far gone. Just let him, spirit, him or her spiritually die. Go on their way. Someone else can help. Now, we can't help somebody if they won't let us help. That horse let them free him. <clears throat> if he didn't, they couldn't have done a thing. It was because he settled, he trusted them, and he left them. Um... Or do we have a shepherd's heart with his whistle of covenant? Who says, look for the five marks. That's what I look for when I'm with somebody before I let them talk to me or minister me. This is what I look for. To see the pierced hands of the King of Glory in his laser light love coming through them. Hands of gentle healing, which are also hands of war or fight. I look for pierced feet, holy light, where they're walking on a highway of holiness and truth. I look for a pierced side, being washed by the blood and the water, where they put themselves under the blood and the water of the Lamb, where they're washed in His covenant love every day. You can see that in a person. You can see it in their eyes, in their heart, and what comes out of their mouth. If they don't have that, they're not ministering to me. Not to the deep places. They can speak a word, but they're not going into the deep places. Because that's the identity of Christ. That's Christ-likeness I'm talking about. It's a servant. It's covenant love. So, it's seeing him. And maybe there's a little mud from the battlefield and the wounds we've had in battle. I know that there's been plenty of times I've been muddy. <laughs> I've been on the battlefield and it's been really rough. And you may not even recognize me when I come off. You may have to wash my face because it's really been out there. I've been hand to hand caught it, fighting for somebody or something. You may not recognize me at first. Just wash me a little bit. I'm still there. And so we have to be careful before I'm saying, to not just be quick. We've got to discern. We've got to test. We've got to really know. We're so quick 
We just judge, just hope, we think we know. Really? Most of what is called discernment is nothing more than soul suspicion. Yeah, it's true. But we take the time to see, is this one, is this his remnant army? Is this one a covenant one? Is this one a champion-hearted one? And which one of us will be the voice that will step forward and whistle and call them home? Because it's by the Spirit. Mm -hmm. It's by the Spirit. The boy couldn't see. He heard and he felt. Because he had this covenant heart and a covenant spirit, he couldn't see the horse. But he began to feel something. And it's knowing covenant champions, which I've already talked about, being set apart for his holy calling, set apart in holy service to the king, walking on the holy highway of holy truth and holy love with a pure covenant heart and spirit. That's what I call the five white marks, the forehead, the hands and feet. It's that identity of Jesus Christ, the way he walked and lived his life. That is our ultimate pursuit and absolutely nothing else. This is why we're here. So this boy is also in the hospital, the same time as the horse. The horse is over here and the boy is in another word, ward. And he begins to hear about a horse. And he's asking, what kind of a horse? What kind of a horse? What's going on? And the doctor wants to kill him. And they ordered him to shoot him. And they're getting ready to shoot him. And the boy begins to release a whistle. And the horse responds. And everybody stops. The gun is aimed. If you remember the scene, if you saw it, the gun is aimed. And the boy begins to come towards the horse. With the help of others because he can't see and he whistles, and the horse responds, and he whistles, and the horse responds again, and they come to each other. He's in search of the horse, blinded. All he can do is whistle his covenant whistle. He can't see, but he's whistling the covenant whistle, but the horse can see, and the horse is coming to him. Such a powerful scene. Such a powerful scene. And when we can't see, there is one who always sees us and is whistling to us and saying, Come home to the safety of my heart. There is always the place to hide and to go. When the battle is raging, always his home, his heart is the safe harbor. His heart is the safe harbor. That's why it's so important we know the Father's heart. And so the horse responds. They come towards each other. And now there's the place of identity. He's my horse. I know this has got to be my horse. He has four white socks. Socks. He's brown and white um, with, with a white mark on his forehead. Four white socks and a white mark on his forehead. And the, and the captain's saying, I don't see him. This isn't your horse. But what happens, he's muddy from the battlefield. He's brown with brown mud. And so what happens is one of the men begin to wash him. And then the doctor joins in. And he washes him. They wash the feet first, and there's the four white socks. And then the doctor gets the water and washes the horse's forehead. And there's the fifth mark. All five marks, they put the gun away. And the doctor says this. We'll tend to your horse and treat him like the soldier We'll tend to your horse and treat him like the soldier he is. And when somebody's come off the spiritual battlefield and their hand hurt him, and it's been some tough times, or they're in the thick of the battle, our cry is, we'll tend to you and treat you as the soldier of the army of God that you are. The war is over and the boy can finally see. The bells ring for the first time in four years. The horse is well and he's healed. It's quite the scene. And the bells are ringing over some of our circumstances and we need to hear them. The enemy wants to keep saying, some of us are still in the midst of battles. For others, the battle is really over. And we need to begin to live under the victory bells of the circle, even in the midst of the circumstances of our lives. There is the victory bell of Jesus, his victory that's still over our lives, even in the midst of trials and tribulations.
nations. And just as that force was identified, Jesus identifies us. They're mine. These ones are mine. They've been marked by me, my covenant seal of the love, my love and my blood. We've been marked. The enemy will try to tell you you're an orphan. He'll keep you in orphan ways, thoughts, but we're not. We're sons of God. Marked and sealed. This is my beloved son or daughter. This one I hung on the cross for. They may be a little muddy from the battlefield, but wash them and you'll see the marks of my covenant love. We'll tend to the horse and treat him like the soldier he is. And this is what God calls us to do. Restore others. Restore those who are wounded. I've had to be restored many times when I've had woundings at the battlefield. At times I couldn't even drag myself off. I had to be carried off, tended to. Thank God for the body of Christ. And I've done the same in return. Many times. Many times. So the officers' horses now, the war is over, but only the officers' horses are going to be shipped back to Britain. The rest are going to be auctioned off. So once again, they're going to be separated. He's gone all the way to France to find his horse, risked his life. They're finally restored. All of them be separated again. So what happens is, all the other soldiers took a collection of 29 pounds to bid at the auction. And he bid against this butcher and all these others, the grandfather of the girl. He bid 100 pounds because he had traveled three days and it was the horse that she loved and that little girl had died of some disease. And I love that picture how they came together because that's the picture of the body of Christ, how we to come together as a community, if you will. We're not auctioning anything and bidding for anybody, but at the same point we come together to help somebody. We come together to rescue somebody. We come together to restore. So, um, the butcher was bidding for the horse, this magnificent horse, but he was bidding for him for horse meat because he didn't see the value of his horse. Magnificent horse. And there's those who don't see your value. You're just somebody sitting in a pew to some wounded individual and you don't really, you know, you're there every week, but they don't really see the value. They don't see the treasure. They don't see the gold. They're not cherished. And there's the grandfather who's living in the past, the memory of his granddaughter, and he said, this horse is all I have left of. So no matter what it costs, I'm going to win this bid. And he did. The highest bid, 100 pounds. So now he would take this magnificent war horse and have it live like a pet in the memory of his granddaughter in some pen back in his home. What a tragedy. The next tragedy that that would be. That's almost as tragic as the horse meat because that's what he was created for. To be a war horse, when you're a war horse, you're meant for magnificent things. You see, if you're just kept in a little pew, maybe you're allowed to pass out a bulletin. We're meant to be, we're magnificent in God's eyes. We're magnificent. Wait till you hear the closing scripture. We're magnificent. going to say it again. You are magnificent in his eyes. Like a proud war horse. They're so amazing. I know you know what I'm talking about, children. The way they <laughs> throw their mane. And they're magnificent. They're so unbelievable. Oh my gosh, I love war horses. Something just goes like, like whoa. <laughs> 
And so what happens is he wants to keep him, the memory of his granddaughter. And so the enemy wants to hold us in places of yesterday. People will try to hold us where we used to be, where what we used to do for God. But that's not where God is. Well, remember, honey, when we used to. No! Let's go someplace. Let's go to the next adventure. I don't want to live in yesterday. I don't want to look through a photo album of what I did for God. I don't want to keep telling the stories of when I went to the Ukraine or when I went there. No! We need now stories, now moments of God. I don't want to be talking two years from now about my trip to South Dakota in June. I better have a fresh story every single day. A fresh story about God and how he's spoken to me and how he's used me. Fresh because we're in the now moment of God. Not yesterday. Um, and so it's the now. It's this pulling and calling inside of us. And people say, well, you're just reckless. You're reckless. You're crazy. Just settle. Settle down, Donna. Just settle down. <laughs> settle down, Donna. You're just way too passionate. No, you don't get it. I am not nearly passionate enough. In my eyes, I'm not. But God is wooing us. And he's wooing our hearts deeper. And he's wooing our hearts higher. And he's wooing us by covenant into the adventure of our lives. And we need to respond to the trumpet call. But it is a remnant. The remnant is the war horses. The remnant that Bob Connor talks about. The remnant that Rick Join is prophesying about. The remnant that Bob Jones, he's home of the Lord, spoke about. It's not little sheep going, blah, blah, I'm afraid, I'm afraid, I'm afraid. Just keep me in the safety of the pen. Somebody feed me, somebody take care of me, somebody do everything for me. Carry me, do something. No. We have not to have a sheep mentality. The only place of the sheep mentality is that we follow him. But we're to mature into the place of, of a war horse where the slightest nudge of his knee, the slightest whisper of a breath, we respond. And he can trust us to ride us into battle. And we will not be deterred. If that camera were a cannon, a war horse will run straight into it and not flinch. He will not flinch. One in a thousand. But in the body of Christ, it's not to be one in a thousand. But it is a remnant. Unfortunately. So. They want to hold us back in the barn. Just eat your hay. You get the water. It's safe. You don't have to go through any weather. It's safe in the barn. Boring. Boring in the barn. I know one thing. I don't want to die of boredom. I'd rather die on the front lines doing something worthwhile in covenant with my king and die in the safety of boring. Boring. Living in the memories of when God moved. Oh, you know, Harriet, way back then in 1910, I mean, I don't want <laughs> <laughs>
who's won the horse in the auction with 100 pounds. He's got the horse. He's trying to lead the horse away. The horse doesn't want to go. The horse keeps trying to get away. He finally pulls away, and he runs back to the boy. And the grandfather in the scene, one of these closing scenes, pulls out those regimental ribbons. And he says, do you recognize these? And the boy said, those were my father's. And so the grandfather gives them back to him and the horse says, you belong together. The world recognizes God. They will know you are Christians by your love. Do we think that was the little changing every moment, soulish love, the love songs we hear on the radio, the country western, oh, Sally left me for Joey or whatever, I don't know, you know, all these sad songs. <laughs> Fickle, I love you today, I don't like you tomorrow. Dance with me today, dine with me today, but tomorrow you can go. I mean, that's the changing, soulish love that Hollywood talks about. The love we're talking about is the unchanging love that comes like a wave of a baptism of love from the Father's heart like a waterfall, like a fountain as we wait in him. Out of Jesus' pierced side it comes the blood and the water. It pours into our hearts as we ask for it. And the deep covenant love of Father God goes into our being. It's part of our DNA and we love what that love. And others may choose to walk away, but we remain steadfast and unchangeable in our love. Even if they walk away, we stand in love. Because our love is to be like the love of the Father, unchangeable. 